Greetings sailors and welcome to the last of the current Patreon Supporter Week videos and we're finishing things off with a pair of, uh, well, Warships games. <laughs> it's kind of a giveaway with uh, the thumbnail and the fact that I said it was going to be Warships. Uh, if you were expecting something different then I really don't know what to say. Now I've not managed to quite fit everybody in with the Patreon Supporter Week. Uh, I think I said something in the first video about oh, if I've got enough material to do six or seven videos. I could actually do another video after this one, but what I've instead decided to do is rather than um, stretch out till Monday, which would be a bit of a funny definition of a week, uh, I'm going to just have those two people I know I didn't manage to squeeze in in the next regular supporter spotlight video. So from Monday forwards, it will just be normal videos once again. So for this last, uh, this last video of this week, um, we're starting off with the Grosser Kurfürst, and uh, yes, it's another German battleship. We've had, uh, what, tier 7, 8, and 10 now of the German battleships. They're quite popular, I mean, they're popular for a reason. Although I have to say, um, I've been sent far fewer replays of this machine. I think a lot of people get up through to the Bismarck and then maybe stop at that point. Uh, because the Bismarck, you know, you get that big jump up in secondary range and uh, it's a very capable ship. And then T9 and 10, well, they're not kind of like big jumps in the same way from, from tier 7 to tier 8. Um, so I, I don't know, maybe they're just less appealing to people for that reason. Personally though, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm on that grind myself now. I'm playing through the Bismarck. And uh, I know it's taken me a long time to get there, and uh, rather enjoying it and uh, looking forward to see what the tier 9 and 10 are like. Anyway, this is a new Patreon. This is Mikasa, and um, as you can see, yes, yeah, secondaries, I think, more or less. And he's just managed to penetrate a destroyer, a regular penetration with a destroyer, in fact. Um, that's a little unusual. But it is possible, and basically uh, the shell has to be armed almost before it enters the destroyer. Uh, so what that means in warship's terms is um, it hits the water just far away enough from the hull that it arms the shell, and then once it go, uh, when it goes in the hull, kablamo. Whereas normally, I mean he had a, a, a full penetration and then three overpens. Normally what happens is uh, it hits the hull arms but by the time it wants to go off it's already passed through the ship in the, the, the time that that's taken. So getting a full penetration on a, a destroyer is reasonably rare but like I said it can happen and there's the proof. So he's racked up already 50k damage and two kills in very close proximity not close enough to actually get a, a double strike but uh, it can't have been far off and as they are basically all grouped around this one cat point um, they kind of need to put the pressure on the enemy they need to bring this focused firepower to bear and wear them down as quickly as possible because the enemy I mean they're sort of clustered around between B and to the south of C as well, but um, there's, I mean, they could easily go in cap A, and at that point they're going to have uh, a strong ticking points advantage, so, I mean, their firepower is relatively clustered up as well, this is, this is going to be a relatively brutal match. So a big hit into that Moskva, who is now um, frantically straightening up and uh, trying to get into cover. And, um, well, he doesn't have torpedoes to worry about, but he's still a somewhat dangerous opponent if he's left to live. He's fairly wounded at this stage, though, so if uh, Mikasa can finish him off, that's going to be uh, useful for the whole team. If nothing else, he's a radar cruiser, so it'll be useful for their team's surviving destroyers. So he gets a kind of raking hit there, uh, two penetrations and uh, an overpen, but also some bounces, and it's the bounces that saved the Moskva. Um, when it's bow on like that, I mean, it's, it's hardly invulnerable, but uh, it's bouncy enough that uh, it can at least survive a little better than uh, some of the more squashier cruisers. Having said that, the tier 10s, I mean, with the exception of the, uh, the, the Minotaur, uh, the tier 10 cruisers generally have a bit of armour going for them. Well, actually, no, the new Henri Catra doesn't really have much either, so yeah, both the Minotaur and the, uh, the Henri Catra are... Uh, 
a bit on the squashy side. So the Moskva's hanging on just about. Um, he's been peppering some of those broadside battleships further down um, to bring him up to now nearly 100,000 damage already, which is not bad going, especially considering the derpy nature sometimes of German battleship guns. Possibly another reason why people don't like this ship uh, that much, uh, because um, although you've got... It's interesting in that you've got a choice of guns, and that makes it unique among the tier 10 battleships, but um, I don't know, some people just don't like the dispersion of German battleship guns generally. But hey, you can't have it all. So this Gearing, who isn't one of the platoons, uh, the, the division um, destroyers, drops some smoke for him. But it's a bit mistimed. Um, it's not really that useful, especially as there's a Moskva parked behind the island. And even though he's low health, well, his radar still works just fine, potentially. So, uh, it was a nice gesture, it was a lovely thought, it's just not much practical use. So no kill on that Tirpitz, um, somebody else burns him out, what is that, an Oodaloy gets that kill. And, um, well, he's, he's being rather bold pushing up on this side, um, but they're now starting to lose control of C. So, somebody's got to do something. <laughs> Now, if they can take out the Moscow, that's good, and, and the gearing is actually now engaging him. Um, it's a bit awkward, though, pushing forward like this, because he's going to be open to fire from some angle, somewhere, whatever he does. So the gearing takes out the Moscow, who had healed a bit, but was still low enough health for that to, to happen. And then the enemy gearing appears, and this is a little bit on the bad side. Now... Uh, Mikasa's got his uh, Hydro going, so he gets additional warning here, uh, but he's lost his ally in the form of that other gearing. It won't have been a bad trade though if they could take out these uh, these ships, because these are all top tier ships they're nobbling here. So there we go, another close quarters. That's his second one in this game. And now he's got a choice of he can angle towards those two uh, German battleships, the Bismarck and the uh, other Grosseker first, or he can go for this Iowa, and he makes the decision to turn in towards the Iowa. Now he's maybe banking on the other battleships, um, focusing on things other than him right now, but I think the Bismarck is also firing at him. The rest of his allies, by the way, still largely clustered behind C. There were a lot of quite passive teammates in this one. Um, I mean, it, they're not doing too badly. They are just about ahead on points. But there are a lot of people that don't seem to be doing much. Now, the Iowa was angling. And seemed to be being sensible and um, trying to deny Mikasa broadside shots. And then he does that. He straightens back out beautifully and... Now Mikasa's sitting on almost 200,000 damage. That's why you don't do that in an Iowa. I almost wondered watching this the first time through if maybe the Iowa was going to go for a ram or if perhaps Mikasa would go for a ram. But uh, no, the Iowa instead did that inexplicable turn and... Uh, or he made that inexplicable turn and basically gave his ship away for free. Um, at that kind of range, you have to expect to just get deleted. And he did. So there was a moment there where most of uh, most of Mikasa's guns were actually out of action. And um, at this point, I mean, he's taken out the IOR, but he's just barely hanging on against the, uh, the Bismarck. And of course, the Bismarck secondaries are pretty much as good as his. And this guy, he's actually angling. So um, he might get some superstructure pens, maybe a deck penetration if he's very lucky, but probably not at this range. So if he can hang on for another minute somehow, he can get another heal back. But he could really use some allies to shoot at this guy. But they're all too far away, basically. The closest ship is a Des Moines, and then uh, there's a North Carolina up behind C still. And the uh, the other division that was uh, in this game, because uh, Mikasa was in a division himself, um, they're now pushing B. They're trying to take control and consolidate their lead, basically. So, um, yeah, it, it's not... It's, it's actually looking 
not too bad. It's looking like they're going to um, come out on top of this one, but it's also looking unlikely that Mikasa will survive. But this is the kind of damage result where, I mean, he took the risk and made the aggressive push and has now died, but um, you could say that was worth it. As it turned out, four kills and 195,000 damage done. He more than pulled his weight. So I've sped up this last bit so we can see the, the Des Moines and the, the Grosser Kurfürst getting taken care of. And then it's just going to be that last Bismarck. So there you go, you can see them chipping away in high speed. And then, well, this next bit is going to be a little bit wonky because I tried to free cam it. And for some reason the free cam was not behaving, it was just constantly in motion. So <laughs> this isn't me trying to be artistic, this is me trying to focus on this uh, Bismarck <laughs> and the free cam just not cooperating. And I don't know why it was doing this, I really don't. It's highly unusual, I think it's just that um, replays have been a little skew if with the, uh, the recent patches of warships. That's just one of those weird little replay bugs. So there we are, final results. Uh, the two close quarters are quite nice, plus two devastating strikes and, of course, high caliber. And uh, that easily put him at the top of his team. But that Oodaloy did very well as well. In fact, the Oodaloy had a Kraken. So between him and the Oodaloy, they took out the majority of the enemy team. It's not bad. So... Um, that was a, a fairly profitable game as well. Um, looking at the actually looking at the, the results, which I don't think I've, I've looked at the detailed results uh, that closely, um, there was surprisingly little damage from his secondaries, considering it's a German battleship. Uh, the vast majority was from his main battery. So this this wasn't one of those German battleship games where it's lots and lots of secondaries fires. No, this was this was all Mikasa's shooting that got him to that place and helped make that the win that it was. Secondly, and lastly, we have this Miyoko game from Armorama, appropriately, perhaps, on the Okinawa map, because, of course, it's a Japanese cruiser, and it's quite a nice one as well. Now, he's bottom tier, but it's not too bad. The majority of both teams appear to be tier 8s, with a couple of tier 7s and a couple of tier 9s, so it's not really, um, it, it's not like he's horrifically bottom tier or anything like that. So we started off going to A, and um, that's actually not too bad. I mean, to get this cap point is useful because it's a cap point. The problems on this map come when you get the whole of your team just going to this one cap point, and then they turtle up behind that island, separating A from B. And you can't win like that. Because all the enemy team has to do at that point is then sit tight and enjoy their cap point advantage and just let the victory points tick up and as long as they're not losing ships at a, a rate that's uh, greater than that then that's a victory in the bag but it's also a very boring big, uh, victory but that's not happening in this case um armor armor has pushed through and it, it looks like this lone enemy york just came along up here for really no reason i can think of uh he's got the support of nobody on his team so um yeah it, it potentially is the case that the armor armor could take this guy out and then maybe play around on this side which is a slightly risky thing to do because he might just have the entire enemy team turn their guns on him but um most of the enemy team has gone to sea and while most of his team isn't really pushing any cap at the moment they are at least in a position to potentially take and defend B, but it, it really does depend on that mass of ships between A and B to actually uh, start being a little more proactive. But I can understand them being a little hesitant to do so because anybody trying to push into uh, B is going to meet that massive enemy firepower coming from C. So this might be a bit of a, a tricky match even though they haven't all piled onto A and uh, adopted that uh, turtle manoeuvre. So there goes the York, who didn't even really seem to be trying to fire back, to be honest. Uh, anyway, um, he had to have done a, a fair proportion of damage through fire. I mean, he had four fires set on that York, and um, he subsequently has managed to get himself an arsonist medal already. 
I've not seen that too often where the very first medal somebody gets is an arsonist medal uh, because it, it usually takes a bit longer. You've usually got to be spamming quite a lot of HE over the course of a battle against a single target. In that case, I mean, he was firing a lot of HE against a single target. It was just quite nice that the target wasn't firing back. So there's one of the enemy destroyers. Neither of them um, were really in a position to do anything to help that York. I mean, the destroyers were just ignoring A completely. So it, it makes it even more mystifying that the York came up here on his own, but never mind. And, uh, well, Alvarama is uh, he's in a reasonably comfortable position right now. The biggest immediate threat, potentially, is that Nagato. And it just depends what the Nagato chooses to fire at. So he's landed a couple of hits on this Mayhan, actually got on a fire, and if the Mayhan's burned his uh, uh, damage control already, then that actually, that's useful more for making the Mayhan just more visible than anything else. The bad news, though, is that the Nagato has indeed taken note of uh, Armorama's aggressive move, and this might turn out to be too aggressive, perhaps. Um, He's now getting to within about 10 kilometers, and maybe he has the thought of he wants to drop torpedoes on this guy. Oh, there we go, there goes the Mayhan. But of course, to do so in the Miyoko requires turning broadside, and oh, oh yeah, no, that was costly. That was very, 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 very costly, and it is in fact basically down to luck that he is alive right now. Turning broadside to a Nagato at that range, uh, that was asking for trouble. Now, of course, the Nagato surely must realise that he has dropped torpedoes. If you see a Japanese cruiser do that, it's a very distinctive uh, telltale sign that they are turning to try and drop torps. So surely the Nagato will take some corrective action to his course to try and avoid the inevitable incoming torpedoes. Surely, surely he will do that. Surely. Yeah, you may have picked up from my tone there that that's not going to happen. No. Um, I mean, he changed his course a little bit and then basically turned back on his original heading and that doomed him. So, although it was an incredibly costly manoeuvre, leaving Amarama on only five and a half thousand hit points, He's now done 70,000 damage, and that was his third kill. So was it worth it? Well, personally, I would have played it a little safer. Uh, I would have tried to stay alive there, because it was really luck that he didn't just get completely annihilated. It really was just playing the odds. Uh, so, I mean, yes, sometimes you do just have to take the chances, but that wasn't a time when he had to take a chance. That was a time when he took it unnecessarily and uh, got away with it. But we're not done yet, even on five and a half thousand health, while he is now a very attractive target for the team, um, there is still damage left to be done. So the team is now pushing on B a bit, I mean they actually capped B and the enemy team is now recapping with their turpuses um, pushing in. Uh, so. It, it's nice to see that his team wasn't being passive, the enemy team wasn't just being passive, they're actually now pushing towards this conflict in the middle, this engagement. So uh, joining um, Armour Armour on this side is this Bismarck, and that's actually very useful, it means he's not the sole target out on this flank. Hopefully the Bismarck will be a more attractive target than him, even though he's a low health cruiser, because uh, it'll be slower moving and therefore a bit easier to hit. One of the enemy purposes, meanwhile, looks likely to go down, and Armor Armor just secures the kill. That's his fourth kill, leaving that one remaining Turpitz on fire and uh, a little bit in trouble. The rest of the enemy team, well, there's one uh, enemy Miyoko all the way over on the 10 line, who's basically irrelevant. He's got, like, a Miyoko, uh, not Miyoko, a Lo Yang, a Kutuzov, and a, a Bismarck probably all firing at him. And on this side, well, uh, the Belfast is um, basically using the island to try and stay safe and um, possibly waiting to smoke up. There's a Pensacola that's retreated back into A for some reason, I'm not sure why. Maybe he just wants to go behind the island to spam HE over the island. And then there's uh, this uh, Bismarck over here with uh, Armor Armor. So, um, they're a little bit scattered, but I mean, they are putting the pressure on this enemy team. 
And although the enemy team has the points advantage at the moment, um, I would not say they, they had a decisive advantage overall. Because uh, the enemy team is a little scattered as well. Maybe not quite so much as uh, Armor Armor's team, but uh, it just depends how well people can focus fire. Now the Miyoko goes down to the Kutuzov, so those ships are going to press down south. Maybe put some pressure on C. And, uh, well, you can see Amarama here, meanwhile, he's trying to stay towards the edge of his uh, gun range as much as possible. He's now having to play this very cautiously, and <laughs> there's the Kraken, uh, because he traded so much health earlier. And although that's a little awkward in terms of actually getting your uh, guns on targets, potentially, uh, it also gives you the maximum possible reaction time to enemy incoming fire. And he needs that, because he doesn't have the hit points anymore. He cannot take the hits, and he cannot absolutely guarantee that enemy ships will only fire at that Bismarck. So the, uh, the Iowa is uh, now turning in towards B a little bit. They're actually recapping B. Um, the Bismarck on the other side, the Luoyang, and the Kutuzov are all converging on the middle. So uh, what's left of the enemy team, apart from the... Uh, is it a Kagero? I can't quite see on the moving map. A Yugumo, there we go. Apart from that, they are all clustered down here. So they've pretty much taken m the control of the map at this point, effectively. Um, the Yugumo might still maybe prove to be an issue, but... As for the rest of the enemy team, they've, they've got them under fire from several different directions. And uh, they are now a little bit in trouble. So, the uh, Iowa, he's struggling to, to keep in range a little bit, so he switches fire to the Ibuki. And, and it looks like he's actually trying to do what that Pensacola was doing earlier on, um, getting back towards the relative safety of A. But... Um, He's got to be a little bit careful not to just, like, if he just goes into A, hides behind a rock, and um, stays alive. Well, it preserves that uh, that uh, um, ship's worth of points for his team, but he's also not really able to actively help his team at that point. Because uh, it, it doesn't quite have the shell arcs of the, uh, the uh, American cruisers, this ship. And if he's far back enough to fire over that island, he might well get spotted himself. So, still just more or less staying at range, although the Ibuki, um, I mean, he's well within range of the Ibuki, actually, at this point. He, he, he could maybe even be firing AP at this guy. Uh, but the Ibuki seems to be much more focused on that Bismarck. And this Bismarck's basically been keeping Armorama alive, unwittingly. Or maybe wittingly, I don't know. But, oh, well, <laughs> even so, somebody's been paying attention. That, that low-health North Carolina decides to take a pot shot, but... Uh, Fortunately, it misses. Now, I thought maybe the Bismarck would be in trouble because that Ibuki looked like he was making a pass to drop torpedoes, but uh, no torpedoes get spotted. I mean, the Bismarck's also got into cover behind the island anyway, uh, so I don't know. I don't know quite what the Ibuki was, was doing there. It has cost him a lot of health. He's, he's now a fairly low health target, and Amarama is... Obviously trying to prioritise him over the uh, Takao. Or is it Takao? I, I never know. Takao just feels wrong somehow, but I don't know. Maybe it is correct. But uh, yeah, you go for the low health targets, especially at this stage of the game. And there we go, he gets another kill. So that's kill number six. If this is one of tanks, that'd be a top gun. Can he get this remaining destroyer? Ah, the answer is yes, kill number seven. Uh, all with less than 100,000 damage done. And that just leaves this one remaining enemy cruiser. So they've basically, I mean, this was a fairly hard fought battle, but they've managed to come through it all right. And despite Armor Armor being on very low health for over half the battle, uh, he's still managed to contribute. But some of those kills were quite low health. Some of those were definitely kill secures. I think, what, three, four of those were, were kill secures? And the question is, well, with this one ship left, can he also secure this kill? Now, he's got a fire burning. That might prove to be it if somebody else doesn't just take this Takao out in one go. There's another fire, so that makes it even more likely 
uh, unless somebody just obliterates him. Uh, so yeah, it, it's just down to will he get that ticking damage at just the right second or will somebody else's shell finish him off? And there it is! The fighter finishes him and that's eight kills. Sadly, there's no achievement for eight kills in World of Warships, but still, that's pretty impressive. So eight kills, almost 100,000 damage done, and uh, the Kraken and the Arsonist medal. So that's not bad. That's not bad at all. But this so very nearly was a different story. I mean, if he'd had that uh, that... Um, take down of the Nagato earlier, but you know, had died before he could get the torpedoes off. Um, I don't think we ever would have seen this on YouTube somehow because it would have just been Cruiser Show's broadside gets deleted. You don't really need to specially go on YouTube to see that happening. You can basically see that happening in pretty much almost every battle uh, of World of Warships. So, um, it was really luck that then enabled him to carry on getting those kills and to get those somewhat remarkable eight kills. Because I don't think I've seen an eight kill game before, and at least not of the replays I've had submitted to me. Um, but nonetheless, you know, I, I, he could have just played it safe, remained unspotted and um, let his allies uh, do the, the brunt of the fighting. But uh, no, no, despite making that somewhat questionable decision, he kept on going and uh, it paid off. He got quite a nice reward out of it. So that's it for this Patreon Supporter Week. Um, if the pattern holds true, uh, and if I remember, uh, the next one will probably be like, I don't know, October, around about that time of year. Um, I'm hoping we'll just get back to a normal schedule next week, but I might take a day or two off uh, on purpose. Because <laughs> sometimes I end up not putting up a video and it's not because I've taken a day off, it's just I couldn't get a video done. Um, but yeah, I might on purpose take a day or two off and then we'll, uh, um, I don't know, get back to doing whatever. I've got in mind a, a CK2 video actually for um, well, something outside of the normal series, so we'll see if that comes to fruition. So hopefully you have enjoyed this uh, this week of Patreon supporter replays. And, um, well, before I wrap this up, I will just once again put on my pimp hat and say, if you feel inclined to support me monetarily, Patreon is there. Uh, I don't really do donations at all, um, but Patreon basically pays the bills because uh, YouTube ad revenue doesn't not even close and um in the last couple of months especially and you might have heard this from other youtubers it's been um uh, fluctuating and it's been um somewhat noticeably down compared to what it should be for this time of year so god knows what google is doing behind the scenes but uh, of course naturally they haven't told anybody anything about it so uh yeah those people that are using patreon um, are probably quite thankful for it right now, and that's certainly true for me. But, I mean, it's always been the case since I started doing Patreon that that has been the, the bulk of my um, my um, income. It, it, you know, it, it's how I, I make my living doing this as a job, basically. So, uh, yes, if you feel inclined, even just a small amount of money every month does help out, and uh, it's all very much appreciated. So, anyway, pimp hat off. And um, all that's left to say is I hope you liked this video. And if you did, you can hit the like button. You can leave any comments below. You can sub to my channel if you haven't already. And as always, stay tuned for more.